Well, last week we started a series called Face to Face. And the purpose of that series, of various purposes, one was to remind us that we are a Pentecostal church and that we need to create an ambience and an environment conducive to the supernatural because we still believe in God's moving power to heal and to raise and to transform and to save people. And we are going to do this by discovering the names of God in the Old Testament. There are a lot of them. I will choose one every Sunday for the next five Sundays. Today's name is the Lord is my provider. And if you want to say that in, in Hebrew, it's Jehovah Jireh. A wonderful thing about this is that behind every name of God, and it's like we're, we're trying to see the face of God and we're going we're gonna to reveal parts of it through his name. Now we know that that the name Jehovah was a tetragram or a four letter name. The Hebrews did not pronounce the name. It was silent. And then the translators begin to add vowels to make the name Jehovah. But in reality, um, the name is the Lord. That, that would be the closest name to the original. So it's not a bad word to say Jehovah, of course, but it is more accurate to say the Lord is my provider. And of course, the King James Version uses Jehovah. Many Bibles use Jehovah, but theologians are beginning to find out that there is a little more precision in the name of God. That's not our topic this morning. Today, that's why I put the Lord is my provider. If you don't have notes, raise your hand, wave, throw something at somebody, and an usher will run and, well, don't throw things, literally, but raise, do raise your hand. Isn't it good to see our friends this morning here? Let's give them a hand. Let's, we're welcoming all of you. Thank you. If you came in just because you saw us on the internet or you walked by or drove by and something pulled you in here, we want to think it was God that brought you here. Praise God. Do you promise to praise while I preach? At the right times. You got to educate your spirit, you know. You just got to do it at the right times. When the word goes out, it's like a wave that goes out and then hits the wall and comes back. And it catches everything in between. And it's an ebb and flow of word and worship. And God dwells in the praises of his saints. And of course, his word is powerful. So here's a story this morning. I will read uh, one of the verses. We're going to be in Genesis chapter 22 uh, today. Abraham named that place. The Lord will provide. And even, even now, people say on the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. So remember, we want to praise worship. I explained the difference between those last week. But we do want to praise and worship today the Lord, our provider. And if you think that I'm using this word provider only to mean that he, that he provides our paycheck or a house or the food or, or the clothes for our children, he does do that. But this is way deeper. This is much more profound what the Lord has provided. And so I am going to um, uh, share with you or present to you what true worship means. True worship means giving to God in certain ways. And I'm not talking about money this morning, so let go of your wallet, your purse. All right, you can let go. You already gave. So we want to give to God. We, we, we come here to praise His name. And um, God comes to, to Abraham. Quickly, Abraham used to be a fabricator of idols in the land of Ur of the Chaldeans. His father had that business. And I don't know what it was that God saw in Abraham that he appeared to him and he said, Look, I'm going to take you from Chaldea and I'm going to take you to a land of promise. I am going to make a huge family out of you. And I'm going to bless those who bless you and I'm going to curse those who curse you. And out of Abraham, he made an entire nation. But now, now when we read the Bible, for example, in Romans, it says that, that um, Abraham did not stutter at the promises of God because he knew that God could do what he promised, even though he was as dead because he, he was supposed to have a baby, but he's 100 years old. And so we see now 
an Abraham with a developed face. I don't want to lose anybody. Stick with me, okay? We see today, looking in reverse, we see an Abraham and we call him the father of faith. And he was. But so no one will be discouraged this morning. Abraham's faith, faith developed. The Christian life is a series of development. Of two steps forward, one step back, three steps forward. Man, we're dancing the Macarena. All this Christian. Is that what that's called? The Macarena? That's what it's called. I don't know. The Louis Louis. You remember, Brother Ben. Brother Ben used to do the Louis Louis. And you know, friends and visitors that don't know Christ, please do not let us give you the wrong impression that we have it all together. Please. We may look okay, but the Christian life is going through, you know, believing in God. It doesn't come. It finally comes. God takes it away. You get healed. You get sick. You pray for a job. You get the job. Then you get sick. You pray for healing. God heals you and you lose your job. It's like, okay, what do you want? And God says, I want you to praise me. It doesn't matter if you're up there or down here. I want you to live for me. I want you to love me. Hallelujah. That's what I want. So watch this. So God tells Abraham, Abraham, 15th chapter of Genesis, and we're going to go 15, 16, 17, 22, but I'm just going to mention him. And he says, look, I'm going to give you a son. Every place you step, that's going to be yours. And look up at the skies. That's going to be like the stars. That's going to be your family. Look at the sand. You're going to have a, just a whole nation that's going to come out of you. But it didn't come. It did not come. And so uh, time goes by and Abraham's getting... Now at this time, Sarah is sterile. Sarah could not have babies. And so, you know, the promise is there. You've got a, you've got a vigorous and young Abraham who can still conceive, uh, uh, who, who can still, I'm sorry, um, uh, uh, create, procreate, but Sarah's sick. And so there's no baby that comes. And then in the 16th chapter of Genesis, they take things into their own hands. And Sarah says, look, like God promised, but it doesn't come. Maybe we need to help God out. Have you tried to help God out? <laughs> I have. It doesn't work. And, and so Sarah says, you know, I can just imagine Abraham sitting there watching Netflix on his rocker, you know, or something like that. Come on, laugh. That was a joke. Would you please help me out here? Come on, lighten up, everybody. And so here comes Abraham with her servant, her maiden, her, uh, her servant. She, Abraham, since we can't have babies, why don't you and her have a baby? And Abraham's like, well, do you think it's the will of the Lord? Come on, baby. You see what I mean? He, he, he jumped on that one. He's, and he has a baby. They have a baby. They have a baby named, well, the, well, rather, she gets pregnant. Her name was Agar. She gets pregnant out of Abraham. And Abraham's like, well, si es la voluntad de Dios. You know, have you ever, have you ever has, has anybody ever given you the wrong change? You know, thank you, Jesus. Is it the will of God and all this stuff? Give it back. <laughs> Give it back. Something happens when we do things the wrong way, when our GPS is slightly kilted, when, when we're not perfect unto God's will. We need to adjust to God and not God to us. A plane can be only a few degrees off, but if that thing's off, man, especially when you're going to land in fog. I just landed this morning here in Ontario, and I'm, you know, when this fog wasn't any of this morning, I'm like, Jesus, Jesus, help that pilot. I'm singing uh, Jermaine Dolly's Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Have you heard that song? It's a neat song. You need to hear it. I'm all over the place this morning. And if the plane's coming in, that, that GPS is off. That thing's going to crash. And Abraham's GPS was a little bit off. Because now there is a pregnant lady in his house, but it's not the pregnant, the lady that's supposed to be pregnant. It's not aligned with the promise of God. And so um, Agar starts to mock Sarah because Sarah can't have a baby. And you know, when her tummy started to show and she started wearing the moo-moos and all that walking, she'd walk around slow around the house because it was an affront in the Old Testament not to have family. So Sarah gets angry and cast her out of the house. And then she goes out there, pregnant, out into the desert, and God says, go back. So she comes back, and then the baby's born. His name is Ishmael. And it's interesting that in the Bible, God named five men. It was God who put the name on Jesus. It was God who put the name on Ishmael. It was God who put the name on Isaac and a few others. And so Ishmael is Abraham's son. 
You see what I mean? But it's not the son of the promise. And now finally, finally, three angels visit him. Abraham is 100 years old. Sarah is 90 uh, years old. She's not, she's not only old, she's old and sterile. And Abraham had lost his, his um, vigor. And he was now unable to function as a man to have a baby. And these guys come and say, Abraham, it's time. You're going to have a baby. The Bible says that Abraham fell on his face and laughed. And inside he said, I'm going to have a baby. Man, you should have seen me when I could. But right now I'm a hundred years old. And, and then Sarah heard it. And Sarah says, a lady of 90 years old is going to have pleasure. That's Bible language. You don't look at me like that. You've got 14 kids, my goodness. <laughs> and so, so they get together and God does the miracle. And Sarah, 90-year-old Sarah, 90-year-old sterile, infertile Sarah, and 100-year-old Tarzan Abraham now have a baby. And his name is Isaac. And the angel told her, because you've laughed, you're going to name him Isaac, and that's, that's, uh, his name means laughter because she laughed. Abraham also laughed. So, you know, all of this is happening while, oh, and then, and then it's time for Isaac's birthday party when he is now going to be uh, eating food. He, he was going to be, um, what do you call it when they don't suck breasts anymore? Weaned. He's going to be weaned. So Abraham makes this big old party. And at the party, Ishmael is 13 years old, and he begins to mock Isaac. And Sarah sees this and gets angry. And now she tells him, okay, Abraham, she's out of here. That baby's out of here. I'm saying all of this because Isaac's sacrifice that we're going to talk about this morning is not the only time Abraham thought he was going to lose a son. So now he has to take 13-year-old Isaac, rather Ishmael, who's his son, his seed. See, the church, sometimes we're pregnant with the wrong things. And when we're, we can be busy and active, but we can be pregnant with Ishmael and not pregnant with Isaac. And being pregnant is still being pregnant. You can come to church and you can be in ministries and you, but, but if your GPS is a little, you can be pregnant with the wrong things. Some of you are pregnant or some of us are pregnant with activity, with busyness, but, but God wants us to align himself with a son of the promise, with Isaac. And there comes a time, see, for a while, your mistake, your problem, Isaac, and your promise can live in the same house for a while. There, there's times we, we make mistakes. We get a whole, ahead of God. We do things we shouldn't. They were off. It wasn't a huge sin for him to have a baby with his, with his wife's uh, handmaiden because they used to have two, three wives and they used to sleep with their wives' slaves. And that, that was the culture. So it wasn't as if, as if you did that today. You'd be, you'd be dead. If your wife catches you doing it. Hi, you know, I'm going to have a baby with a maid. Okay, maid, you'll be, you'll be shot in the back. <laughs> and so, you know, it wasn't a huge, huge sin, but it was wrong. And if, if you want to, if you want to have success in the Lord, if you want to move forward in the Lord, you cannot be entertaining Isaac and Ishmael. You cannot, for a while, your problem and your promise can live in the same house for a little while. But there comes a time where you need to take your mistake. You need to take what is part of you. You need to take that and you need to walk it like he did. And he walked into the desert. And do you think Abraham was not weeping? This guy's 13 years old already. And he gives him a flask of water and a piece of bread. And he, him and his mother have to go and walk in the desert. And Abraham stood there. Until the specks disappeared. And his heart was heavy. There's things that I need to get rid of. That you need to get rid of. Things that are painful. The Christian life my friends and brothers and sisters. is painful sometimes. It, it's not a smooth ride. Like okay I'm in the Lord. Let's go. No it's painful. There's good. There's bad. There's more bad than good sometimes. There's more good than bad. 
So Abraham stands there and stares. That's my son. But now, for the first time, he can walk into the house and he can embrace Isaac. And now he can put his full attention on the promise because your problem will mock your promise all the time. Ishmael will always mock Isaac. Always. There's some of you can't praise God because you sin, because there's a little bit of guilt or something. Allow the blood of Jesus to cover that and say you need to send your you need to send your problem to the desert and come back and embrace the promise. So all of that happens. And then in the 20 in the 22nd chapter, where we're gonna be today, God comes to him and, and giving. To God, or true worship means giving to God individually. I wonder if I can get the confidence. Thank you. Indi put it up here too so I can see. Yeah. This is an individual proposition. There are times when God speaks to the church and to the mass and to the congregation. But there's going to come a time in my life, in your life, when God knocks and he says, I want to talk to you. I want to deal with you. I want to invest me in you. I want you to grow. I want to form you. It's going to be painful, but I want to talk to you and you can't escape that. The Bible says God decided to test Abraham. So he spoke to him. Abraham answered, here I am Lord. And you can't pay. There are certain things nobody can do for you. People can pray for you, but people cannot praise for you. You know what I wish? I wish I could pay somebody to, they can go to the dentist for me. I'll give you 500 bucks, all that stuff. Thank you, here's 500 bucks. Nobody can go to the dentist for me. If I want the work done, I have to go to the dentist. Nobody can praise for you. There are things that only you can do. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go to the house of the Lord. I will bless his name. And God stood, imagine for a moment, the almighty creator, the omnipotent God coming and knocking again. And Abraham's like, oh no, man, we had all that rigor, all that circus with the babies and Ishmael and Isaac, and you already made me cry. I already embraced him. See, sometimes we think that as, as we do good with God, and we say, okay, let's float to heaven. You do not get to heaven on cruise control. There's going to be a series of bumps and bruises and tears and laughter. But what is pleasing to God is that we say, you are my provider of joy and of peace and of tranquility. We need to learn to give to God immediately. He says, Abraham, here I am, Lord. Take now thy son. No delay. Have I learned, have you learned that when God speaks, we do it now. Take now thy son. So, you know, well, I'm in a season right now, and, and uh, I guess last October and November, we'd say, well, maybe in 2018, we'll get things together. Or as soon as I get out of school, or as soon as I have this baby, or as soon as we have the wedding, and then we settle in after the honeymoon. You know, well, no, when God knocks on your door, he wants it now. Because he knocked now. And he says, take now your son. The son that you didn't have. When I promised it, the son that you got ahead of me and had another son, the son that I gave you when you were a hundred years old and your wife was 90 and sterile, that son, all of that things. Now I want you to take him and then giving to God is also giving intimately. Go get Isaac, your only son. What does Isaac mean again? It means laughter. And in your Christian walk, there will be times when God will knock at your door and he'll ask for your laughter. There will be seasons when laughter is not heard in the halls of your soul. There will be seasons of weeping, of suffering, of pain. Some of you are going through it right now. And, and when God requests now, 
I'm going to knock on your door and I'm going to take your laughter. I want it now. This is an intimate call. When you get the cancer, when your son is sentenced for 25 years, when your marriage is in trouble or has ended, when, when, when you, some of you haven't laughed in 217, you did not laugh. This is not an accusation or a judgment. It's just a statement of fact that we go through things because it was God who asked for the laughter. After you promised, after all that, God, and now you want him. Take now thy son. It's intimately. Go get Isaac, your only son. And then it's incomprehensibly. My, my laughter, God, my peace. Now, there's going to come times in our life when everything is okay. We've got the job, got a little bit of extra money, boss is behaving, little bonus coming in at the end of the year or, or whatever. Kids are doing good. Your little peewee baseball hit the ball and ran the first and not the third. That's something to give thank God for. Things are going good. Your wife looks good. You look good. Things are going good. And that's good. While those times are there, you need to enjoy them. Don't feel guilty. Don't feel guilty. But know that in the Christian walk, God will sometimes be incomprehensible and say, go get laughter. Right now, I'm going to put you through a season of seriousness, of somberness, of weeping, of thinking, of deepening. Do you give your child everything he wants at the grocery store? They want ice cream. They want candy. They want a hamburger. They want pizza. They want everything. They don't eat anything, right? And if God gave us everything we wanted when we wanted it, we would be spoiled children. But God knows how to deepen us. And then this is incalculably. I think I made up that word, but it means that you can't calculate. The one you love dearly. It seems like God to take your son, stab your only son, twist. The one you love dearly, lemon. God really knows how to put the knife in. God really knows how to, you know, and it seems like our problems never come on a motorcycle on a Harley Davidson. They always come on a bus. And they get off one after another. Have you ever seen those buses going to Vegas where about 500 people get off? The little old, old ladies walking off, man. They're going to they're gonna go to Vegas. And I've sat there sometimes watching them. Not at Vegas, but yeah, I was in Vegas last Wednesday and I went to preach. And uh, you said, you, they just get, man, how did they have impact in there? And that's how sometimes our problems come. They come in a bus one after another. And, and just when, you know, you got the news from the doctor and your kid's not acting right and all this stuff. And then your transmission goes out. And you're just like, ooey. Take your son, your only son. And let me remind you, Abraham, the one you love. I already made you get rid of one. And now I'm asking you for another. And Abraham said, where's all the promise? Where's the bless? I'm going to bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you. Ooh, ooh, everywhere your footsteps, I'm going to give you that real estate. But this way of God, see, to, to understand God's provision, we need to have lack. To understand God's grace, we need to understand the gravity of the law. To understand death, you've got to, life, you've got to understand that there's death. And to understand provision, you've got to know that we must lack sometimes. And so... To worship is sacrifice. Part of it is, like I said last Sunday, praising. And you, you, by the way, you guys, this morning you got an A, an A minus, because next Sunday you got to get an A. Rising early, so Abraham got up early the next morning. I'm not talking only about a five o'clock rising and and praying or uh, uh, maybe I'm directing this part to the younger generation. 
Rise early. Start early. Start investing in God early. I've talked to countless men who have given their life at 60, 70 years old. And they say, Pastor, why didn't I do this when I was 25? Why didn't I give my life to the Lord when I was 30 years old? When my kids were small, I could have guided them through the paths of righteousness. I could have taught them the word. And now my family's gone. I love them. But, but why? Young people rise early. Start early. Start memorizing scripture now so that when you're my age, you can have half the New Testament memorized. Start learning how to pray now so that you can get in the prayer room and you can put in a couple hours there with no problem because you'll be in shape because you started early. One of the regrets that I have, I know some of you are how old are you? I'm only 60 and 60s and no 40, so shut up. I'm diabetic. My wife doesn't let me fast. My nutritionist doesn't let me fast. My doctor doesn't let me fast. And I asked the question, how do I fast? When I went to my nutritionist, she said, you don't fast. And then she explained to me everything that happens when a diabetic doesn't eat. And I said, how am I going to get? And I wish that before when I was diabetic at 44, that, that between 20 and 44, I wish I would have put in seven days of fasting. I can do one day and eat at night, maybe two. And after the third day, I look like a helicopter. I elevate. And right now that you've got strength, right now, some of you guys that are single and you don't have a girlfriend and, and you can go to the prayer room and stay there for three days. Rise early. Get to know God early. Learn the art of sacrifice right now that you're young. And then this is giving of self. And he chopped wood for the fire. So God says, give me your son. When he says, when he tells him, go up to the land of Moriah and there you're going to sacrifice him. Abraham knew exactly what he had to do. He knew the art of sacrifice. He knew, he knew the stones. He knew he had to put wood. And he knew that the sacrifice was putting a lamb and laying the lamb down, tying it down, cutting the uh, uh, artery of the neck. The blood would spill. And uh, Abraham would then light fire and the wood and the lamb would burn and the smoke would go up and God would be appeased. He knew that. But now instead of a lamb, it's got to be my son. And Abraham, can you imagine him that morning when he rises early and he gets his axe? The Bible says that he chopped the wood. He and chopped wood for the fire. Every splinter, every spray of chip, every time the ax would thud, Abraham is weeping. Abraham is giving of himself. Sometimes God is going to make you not only burn your son, but you've got to chop the wood with which you're going to burn him. And Abraham has already went through this. I already saw one of my sons go to the desert. I don't know if he died. By the way, he didn't die. He got very rich. He lives in Dubai. And every time you fill your car with gasoline, you are making Ishmael very rich. God said, I'm going to bless him. And God kind of spilled too much on them. No, not too much, but spilled a lot. Why didn't he do that with the Mexicans, man? <laughs> oh. I, it's all right, it's all right. I want to leave a pile. No, leave it there. You good, good, good. Yeah, I want to make a statement, Luis. Got to chop some wood. Chop some wood. There's times you're going to have to take it off. There's times you're going to have to roll the sleeves back. There's times in your Christian walk that, you know, in New Year's, we wore the tux, didn't we? But now, and there he is. Oh! 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 Come here, Isaac. Where's, where's little Isaac? 
And he's, stand right here, son. Stand right there. What do you think Abraham felt in his heart when he begins to load that wood that he, he gave of himself? It's the hardest thing for some of us to do, to give of ourself. Yeah. And, he's, and it, it, Isaac said, Daddy, I get to go with you. Yes, sir. Are we, going, are we going up to Moriah again where you do the sacrifices? Yes, son. Here, hold your hands out. Hold your hands. And Isaac starts, starts loading the wood on him. Loading the wood. And he finishes. And, and he said, looks at his face. Let's go, son. Let's go. And Abraham's got the torch of fire. And they're walking. They're walking. And how do you, every step that Abraham took was a step towards the killing of his son, the sacrifice of his son. And then Isaac says something. He says, Dad, Dad, wait, wait. You've got the fire and I've got the wood, but where's the lamb? We always bring the lamb. We forgot that. You want me to go back and get it? And Abraham just said, God will provide himself a lamb, son. God will provide himself a lamb. Stay right there, son. Stay right there. When they get to the base of the mountain, Abraham does something. He tells the servants to stay with the donkeys. And he says this. And on your notes, I want you to write a word that is a King James Version word. But I, I put it in King James and then I put it in the, in, the, in, in, in the CEV version on the verse. That word is going yonder. Because in the King James Version, Abraham says, stop guys, stop, leave the animals Leave the service because there's sometimes that your gifts and your talents and your service of God, God's going to say, I don't even want that right now. That's got to stay down here because we got to go up and look at what Abraham says. He says, stay here while my son and I go over there. And in the King James, it says, we're going to go to a place called, we're going to go yonder. And yonder is over there. Yonder is that place where God at times will take us. Things can be normal for a while, but God will knock. And you'll say, son, I want you to know me better and I want to know you better. And we're going to go yonder. We're going to go over there. Everything stays right here. The lad and I are going to, give me the verse up here, please. The lad and I are going to go over there to, to worship. I'm going to kill him. I'm going to lay him on the altar. And Abraham says, we are going to go worship because Real worship, it's not just praising the Lord and singing. That's part of what I told you last Sunday. Real worship is giving God what he asks for now without any ifs and buts. And some of you, God has been asking for your talents. God has been asking for your heart. God has been asking for your time. God has been asking for something and we set it off. And real worship is sacrifice. We're going to go and we will come back. Now, wait a minute. I've got a problem here, Abraham. Aren't you going to, aren't you going to sacrifice him? Why then are you saying that we're going to come back? Are you going to, are you going to pull a fast one? Aren't you going to go and do what God told you to do? What do you mean you're going to go worship? And we're going to come back. The book of Hebrews, the 11th chapter and the 19th verse, reveals to us why Abraham said that. Here's what Abraham was going to do. Abraham was going to take his son and his knife. Come. Come, Isaac. Come. And as they draw close to the land of Moriah, the imagery is going like a bad movie through Abraham's. And he places 
his son on the altar. And the reason Abraham said, we're going to go worship. See, killing his son is worship if God asks for it. And the reason he said, we're going to go up there and worship. Hebrews eleven nineteen 19 says, because Abraham knew. Abraham was going to kill him. He was going to burn him. But he knew that God could raise him up from the dead. One of the, one of the, one of the versions says, he knew that God can bring him up from the ashes. So here was Abraham's thinking. Abraham is saying, I'm going to do it. I'm going to suffer. I'm, I'm going to have to take the knife and cut my own son's throat. And after I burn him, have you ever smelled a burning body? Abraham, all of his senses were ready. All of them. He was going to smell. He was going to hear the cries of Isaac. You think Isaac was just going to sit there and say, okay, daddy. Isaac must have been saying, what? what? Lay down, son. Lay down. Have I, have I told you about my God? I'm going to kill you, son. I'm going to cut your neck. And the blood is going to drain. And you know, I'm going to burn you. But it won't be a half hour. Because, I, because he promised me that out of your loins, we were going to get a nation. And if he said it, I will believe it, son. So I'm going to burn you. And then I'm going to raise my hands. And I'm going to say, okay, God, I did it. And Abraham believed that God was going to raise him up. And he was going to walk back to the servants with a brand new, resurrected, and, 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 and a decomposed now a composed Isaac. How do you get a body back from the ashes? How do you get a body back that was burned? Abraham doesn't know. He just knows. Jehovah. God, you asked for it. I will give it to you. I believe in you. You've never failed me. You've hurt me. You haven't harmed me because God will not harm. He will hurt. God is like a good dentist. He might, he might hurt you, but he won't harm you. And, and Abraham was to the point of bringing the knife down to his son's throat. And an angel from heaven says, Abraham! Abraham! Do not extend your hand. Do not hurt the child. And then God says something fantastic. Now I know that you fear me. Now I know because you did not withheld, withhold even your son from me. Let me ask you a question. What are you withholding from God this morning? What has God been asking? You notice God didn't ask for, you know, David and his kingdom. You read the book of Chronicles or, or Kings. It says, and David offered 10,000 goats and 1,000 lambs and so many bullocks. And, you know, the, the quantity of the sacrifices of a king could not even measure to when God asked you. And many of you have your Isaac, your laughter on the altar today. And you're going through something. But if you obey God, if you obey God, God will be faithful. But, but I've got, I've got a sacrifice. And the Bible says that, that Abraham looked back. He said, what's that? What's that over there? What's that? And caught in a thicket. Caught in a bush was a little ram. This is what I'm kidding. This is, this is it right here. Isaac, 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 get off, son. Get off. Isaac, get off. <laughs> Isaac, get off. Get off. 
Get up. Wait. Wait. Come here. Come here. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. And, and he takes, he takes the ram. Can you imagine the sacrifice and the heart with which Abraham sacrificed the lamb cut in the thicket? Because at the very end of your notes, you know what it says? It says, ah, God will always provide something else. So, so let me begin to close here. Come here, buddy. By the way, this is my grandson, Sam. So he says, Dad, I got the fire. I got the wood. You got the fire. Where's the lamb? Notice that Abraham did not say, God will provide us a lamb. He said, God will provide himself a lamb. And it was thousands of years later when John the Baptist, the precursor of Jesus Christ, John the Baptist is preaching a, a sermon, a message, a fire and of repentance. All the Jews and the, the, the authorities of the temple, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they would come up to hear him, but this guy's weird. He's got fire in his eyes. He's got the spirit of Elijah, the Bible says in the last book of chapter of Malachi. And there, you know, and... and, and and John the Baptist's message was not welcome to Fountain of Truth Church where we want every heart healed. Welcome. Come into our connection center. We'll give you a mug with candy. Or, or out there we'll give you cookies or something. Come, we're so glad. Would you come again? Here's John the Baptist's message. You bunch of snakes. Uncircum, incircum, circumcised. You bunch of rebels. And he has one leg in the water in the Jordan and one leg on a rock. And he's just laying into them, you bunch of hypocrites. And he's preaching. And then he has to stop his message because Jesus, at 30 years old, for the last time, closes his father's carpentry shop. He locks the door. He had already swept the sawdust and put away the tools. Message, clean your room. You know, if I would have resurrected from the dead and maybe you, I would have gone like this with my head scarf that Jesus was uh, buried in, I would have gone like, Woo -hoo -hoo -hoo. hallelujah, I'm alive. You know what Jesus did? He folded the headrest. And when the ladies walked in, they found it folded. What does that mean, Pastor? Clean your room and clean your car and be clean. And Jesus, I've been helping Joseph, Mary's husband, my stepfather. I've been helping him, but now he sweeps it all up. He puts the hammer and he puts the, the chisels and the saw. He puts them away. He locks up the carpentry, uh, the, the, the door, and he walks. It's time. It's time. And he walks over with his white robe and his hair moving in the wind. And John is over here. You bunch of snakes and hypocrites. John looks over. Whoa! He stops. And Isaac's question hung in the air for ages, for years, for centuries. Where's the lamb? Where's the lamb? Where's the lamb? And John the Baptist answered Isaac's question, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Hallelujah. True worship is not just coming in here and singing songs. True worship is knowing that it was the blood of Jesus, the perfect and holy and unblemished Lamb of God who hung on that cross to pay for my sins and your sins. Behold the Lamb of God. So, God provides the Lamb and the ram. He provided Jesus, the Lamb of God, for our salvation and redemption. And today, He is so nice that He doesn't have any problem giving me that raise. He doesn't have any problem allowing me to buy that house. He doesn't allow that problem to bless me. He doesn't have the problem to bless me. He provided my lamb and for that I worship. But every day he provides the ram. He provides my little substitute. God doesn't want you, your little kids to be with no shoes and you with hungry. We are his people. God, God 
doesn't have any problem blessing us, but he will pass us through ups and downs of life. The problem, and as I close, is that sometimes we seek more the ram than the lamb. And if we would seek the lamb, the ram will come. And sometimes the lamb is, the ram is right there. It's just hiding in a thicket. It's just there. And God's going to open your eyes to see where it is. But after he has tested you. Jehovah, my provider. My provider. Anyone this morning, you may stand. Anyone this morning going through the going through the process. Has God asked anyone to put something on the altar that you don't want to, that it hurts, it's painful. Others, God may be asking you to walk Ishmael out, out of your house. I don't know where you are in this story. But I do know one thing, that at the end, God is always faithful. Always.